In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Venerable religious and parishioners, the angels are not something we can study from human reason alone. We can study the angels only from divine revelation. And God has revealed that he has created these special beings that have a soul but no body. They're pure spirits. God is a pure spirit. We human beings are bodies with souls. We are a mix of spirit and matter. And that's a pretty interesting thing. That's miraculous, actually, if you think about it, because spirit and matter don't get don't go together. It's like mixing oil and water. But God can do anything, so he did create human beings that would have this material part and a spiritual part. And, of course, the material part dies one day. It's laid in the tomb. The soul never goes out of existence. It exists eternally. And at the end of the world, God will raise all bodies from the dead and reunite each body with each soul. God can do that. He can do anything. But before God created human beings, he created angels. We know this because the serpent, or the devil, who was in the, took the form of a serpent to tempt Eve, he must have obviously been existing before that. So God created these pure spirits, such a vast number, we can't even begin to estimate it or calculate it. Whole, scripture tells us that they are in various ranks. We call them the nine choirs of angel. I believe every one of those choirs is named in some point in scripture. But these pure spirits could not be admitted to the beatific vision without being put to a test. Every being that has free will has to make a choice. And angels are greater than human beings. They have greater intellect. They have greater power. They're actually not in this imperfect state, so to speak, of having a body. It's truly amazing to think of the powers that these pure spirits have. They can, besides, as I mentioned, the, the great intellect, the great power, they're not bound by the laws of human or physical body, so angels move at the speed of thought, far faster than the speed of light. They can be in more than one place at the same time. The human body is always located in one place. It doesn't mean they're omnipresent, only God is present everywhere, but an angel can be in, a, in more than one place at the same time. That's why our guardian angel is both with us and also in heaven at the same time, enjoying the beatific vision. So God put them to a test. They had to pass a test. Will you be obedient to God or not? Will you submit to your creator or not? The Apocalypse tells us that the ones that refused to submit to God, who said, we will not serve, we will not obey, became the demons. They became the evil or bad angels. We don't know what this test was. We can only speculate Spiritual writers have thought it was perhaps the incarnation, that they would have to adore the God-man, or maybe that they would have to submit to his mother, the queen of angels. 
And remember, human beings are below angels. And for the angels that were giving into their pride, they did not want to accept that. If indeed, as I said, that was the test. So, reading from the apocalypse, we read about this tremendous battle that took place. And God deputed St. Michael to lead the battle. So that gives us an idea of his tremendous role, his dignity, his, his great rank. And he's our special patron. And we see him in so beautifully portrayed in the stained glass window. His motto is his name. Mikael in Hebrew means who is like God. That was the battle cry of St. Michael, who with the good angels submitted to God, who said yes to God. How many angels of that countless number rebelled? We don't know for sure, but the apocalypse mentions that the great dragon dragged his tail through the heavens, pulling down a third of the stars. Some think that was a way of estimating how many angels rebelled, uh, at least a third of them, of that countless number. So when the angels that rebelled became bad angels, they lost their love, they lost their holiness, but they did not lose their power or their intellect. They were allowed to keep that. That's part of their nature. So angels are very powerful. Fortunately, as St. Augustine says, this is is an, uh, an analogy that he makes. He says, the devil is like a chained dog, a fierce dog that wants to rip you apart. Don't get too close. Don't allow the, this rabid dog to intimidate you. And the devil can only hurt us as much as God allows. And as I said, he's restrained. He's got the chain on. What is the power of a good angel? We can't, again, we can't visually see or experience angels because they're pure spirits. But to give you an idea of how powerful an angel is, we read in the fourth book of Kings, in the verse, verse 19, that King Ezekiel was faced by an immense army of Assyrians that were about to, I believe, on the next day, invade Jerusalem. And how is he, I mean, it was, an, it was incredible, the number of enemies arrayed against him. He prayed. The people in Jerusalem were praying, save us from this. There's no way we can successfully battle against them. So they prayed. And that night, one angel was sent by God to go into the Assyrian camp. And that one angel killed 185,000 soldiers. Again, 4th book of Kings, chapter 19. Read it for yourself. That's what one angel can do in one night. Imagine Sennacherib, the the Assyrian king, waking up the next day to see his whole army dead, or most of them anyway. So we know the power of the angels from divine revelation. It's related what they do. You can also see Sennacherib knew the power of an angel. He withdrew, as scripture says. I think he was running out of there as fast as he possibly could. He didn't want to get killed either. And ultimately, my dear brethren, we have to remember it's a spiritual warfare that's going on. You know, when we see the evil and wickedness going on in our day and age, remember, it's not ultimately a political problem or a social problem. 
It's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual battle. As St. Paul says, our, we are not fighting against the principal, uh, against the rulers of this world, but against the principalities and powers. Ultimately, it's the battle between good and evil. And it's a battle that we have to fight every day of our lives against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Every day we have to fight the battle and say like St. Michael did, yes to God and no to the devil. No to our fallen nature when it wants us to commit sin. Deny ourselves. Say no to the world that wants to beguile us with its false promises. So that's really what it's all about. And thank God we've been given. And this, it's not a stretch to say this is an apocalyptic age in which we're living. We have, as our special patron, God provided in his providence that this area of West, Eastern Washington would be put by the early Jesuit missionaries under the patronage of St. Michael. And Saint, Mount St. Michael continues to stand as a great tribute to this saint, as a tribute to the power of God. The traditional Catholic faith is held and lived. We've been through many a trial ourselves, but we are here, we're persevering, and St. Michael has been fighting for us. I find it interesting that when the angel appeared to the three Fatima children in 1916, the year before Our Lady appeared six times to the children, or at least five times, that he identified himself as the angel of Portugal. He didn't say it was St. Michael, but he says, I am the angel of Portugal. But who has the whole country of Portugal been devoted to St. Michael. And remember what I said, angels can be at more than one place at the same time. So while St. Michael is looking over Portugal, interacting with the three Fatima children, he's in all the other places that God wants him to be, doing his duties. have a great devotion to St. Michael. He was given, as I said, to be our special patron here. And I, as a young seminarian, when we moved in in 1978, I thought that the name would be changed. You know, sometimes that happens. You know, when you're under new management, you know, we were able to purchase, make, make the purchase uh, from um, the Jesuits. I thought a name change would would happen, like maybe it would be called Mount St. Louis de Montfort or something like that. But fortunately, and I think this was a very good thing, the name was kept. We've been here for 42 years. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to St. Michael. Each one of us, besides the having that patronage of St. Michael, has a guardian angel. This is something that's easy to forget about because we don't see our angel. But it has been the constant teaching of the Catholic Church that every one of us has a guardian angel. At what point is that angel assigned? Is it from the moment of conception? Uh, the general thinking is it's, at the, it's on the day of birth. It's the, while the child is being carried by the mother, the guardian angel of her watches over both of them. So that's why sometimes your birthday is called your angel day. That's not defined church teaching. You're not required to believe that. But we do have, we are required to believe that we have a guardian angel that is with us throughout our lives. And one point that I do counsel everyone to do is to have a name for your angel. Wouldn't it be a shame to go for years with, with this constant companion in your life and you don't have a name for him? By the way, scripture, whenever it represents angels, it represents them under the masculine gender. Uh, doesn't mean that you couldn't 
he would be forbidden to per portray a, an angel under the female. Remember, they're not masculine or feminine. They don't have a body. But scripture sees them in that, you know, in that uh, male sort of role. So anyway, have a name for your guardian angel that you, so that you can call upon him. Call upon your angel. Say a prayer, you know, in a, in a quiet moment, and just ask your angel to inspire you with the name to a, with which to address your angel guardian. And I believe it will come to you. And he, the, your angel is there to constantly help you. He's there every second of your existence. He's there to help you fight the battles, to inspire you, to help you. And yes, when we commit sins, it grieves our angel. When we do good, it makes our angel happy. So remember that. Honor your angel. And remember too, and I'll make this, try to wrap this up very quickly. Remember that when that orphanage of the holy, with the chapel of the angels was scheduled for destruction in Superior, Wisconsin, we were able to save this, the altars, the statues from that. And in 1988, three semi truckloads brought it all over to Spokane. And here we had it. It was in 1991 that it was installed in our chapel and it's been a perfect fit. The main altar, the two side altars, and we couldn't even use all of the angel statues. We've used as many as we could put in here, uh, but God's providence reminding us of St. Michael and the angels looking out for us. So just one more reason to be so grateful to God for all that we have. May your holy guardian angel keep inspiring you to a greater love and service to Almighty God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.